Welcome to Sierra College's Ensuring Participation Increasing Voter Access webinar, one of a series of webinars from our Civic Engagement and Voter Empowerment Projects. Our panelists are California Secretary of State Alex Padilla and State Senator Ben Allen. Alex Padilla is the California Secretary of State. He is focused on modernizing the office, increasing voter registration and participation, and strengthening voters' rights. In 2018, he launched the California Motor Voter Program, which automatically registers eligible Californians to vote when they obtain or renew their state ID or driver's license. The program registered 1 million new voters in its first year alone. In November 2019, California reached a record high 20.3 million registered voters. He also oversaw the 2018 election in which 64.5% of registered voters cast a ballot, the highest turnout for a gubernatorial election since 1982. He sponsored legislation in 2005, sorry, in 2015 to establish voter centers, expand early voting, and implement same-day conditional voter registration through the Voters' Choice Act. Previously, he served two terms in the San Fernando Valley and California State Senate and represented the East San Fernando Valley on the Los Angeles City Council. He grew up in the San Fernando Valley, attended local public school, and graduated from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology with a degree in mechanical engineering. Elected in 2014, California State Senator Ben Allen represents the 26th uh, Senate District covering the West Side, Hollywood, and Coastal South Bay communities of Los Angeles County. Among the many issues he has worked on, Senator Allen has championed campaign reform and transparency issues. He authored a new law that increases voter turnout and civic engagement by transforming how elections are conducted. Senator Allen was the board president for the Santa Monica Malibu Unified School District, where he was a leader on issues on environmental sustainability, financial accountability, and community engagement. Prior to his election to the Senate, he was a lecturer at UCLA's law school, where he taught educational law policy. Senator Allen has a Bachelor's of Arts degree in history from Harvard University, a master's degree in Latin American studies from the University of Cambridge, and a Juris Doctor's degree from UC Berkeley. Our student interviewers are Camila Vareste and Yulia Teresova. Camila is a journalist and anchor for Sierra College's news site, Roundhouse. She loves reaching, researching, and telling stories. As an aspiring news anchor, she has a passion for finding out the truth and telling people about it. Camelia also enjoys classical music and is a cellist. She is majoring in journalism and minoring in music. Yulia Tarasova is one of two Board of Governors student members as well as Director of Public Relations for the Associated Students of Sierra College. Yulia is majoring in Computer Science and Business with a particular interest in cybersecurity, education, and public service. As executive member of Student Senate Caucus, she helped advocate for the introduction of AB 2910, which ensures that all student trustees in the California Community College system will be given advisory vote. Thank you everyone for being here today. Camelia, we'll begin with you. Secretary Padilla, from our research, I understand that California has been making it easier for eligible voters to vote. Let's talk about some of the ways in which voter access has been expanded, beginning with voter registration. California has had online registration for a while. This is especially important during the pandemic so that people can register safely from home without having to risk their health. With that being said, we also have same day voter registration. What is it and how is it done? Great, thank you, Camilla. Good, good question because it's been uh, uh, very helpful to people who uh, uh, might miss what you used to be the deadline for registering to vote and being able to vote in an upcoming election. Uh, so same day registration uh, is in place in California. Technically we refer to it as conditional same day registration. Uh, and I'll explain what that means in a second. But uh, what it means is in the last couple of weeks before the election, 
Uh, if you haven't registered to vote or updated your voter registration, you can still show up in person uh, and do it in person. So you're registering or update your registration record and you get your ballot. Uh, and the county officials simply hold on to that to make sure that they process the registration first after the election before counting your ballot. But we take that extra step to allow people who are eligible to vote to still be able to vote, even though they might have missed what used to be the voter registration deadline. Uh, look, you, you uh, acknowledged online registration, which we passed since 2012. In California, same-day registration uh, is a great uh, option uh, for, for voters who need it. Uh, California also allows for pre-registration. So we now invite 16 and 17-year-old citizens to register in advance. They can't start voting until they turn 18, uh, but you can get your information into the system when you're 16 or 17. And frankly, more than 500,000 young people in California have done just that since we launched the program. Uh, but I think the biggest, biggest tool that we've used to increase registration in California is automatic voter registration. Uh, you know, uh, through the DMV, when people go to apply for or renew, their driver's license or their state ID uh, or to change their address when they've moved, if they're eligible, they're automatically registered to vote in the process unless they choose to opt out. And uh, we've had uh, more than a million voters in the first year alone added to the rolls because of automatic registration. Uh, we just hit the 2 million mark recently. And so uh, that's all the people who are now able and uh, uh, ready to vote this November. Wow, that is incredible. Can students who are experiencing homelessness register to vote? Uh, yes, good question. And it's not just students who might be experiencing homelessness. Anybody, uh, any citizen who may be experiencing uh, homelessness, you know, the law is very clear. If you're 18 years or older and a citizen of the United States, with minimal exception, you have the right to vote. And so when you're registering to vote, uh, ideally, right, you plug in a, a street address as to where you're registering. Uh, but if you don't have one, uh, law, state law does allow you to include sort of a, a description of what you consider your residence. Is it an intersection? Is it, you know, a certain area? Uh, and you can also vote by mail. Uh, there's a lot of people experiencing homelessness that will let the county elections officials know, send my ballot to... Maybe it's a homeless shelter, maybe it's a food pantry, some place that they frequent and are able to receive uh, a ballot there or the county elections office itself. Uh, and all of them are reasons to make sure that people have plenty of in-person opportunities to vote both on and before election day and uh, participate in same day registration if you need to uh, or cast your ballot if that's all you need. That is really great to hear. Given the pandemic, it seems that same-day voter registration is especially important so that eligible voters can register in po person at a polling place on election day or during early voting. Uh, with that being said, will there be early voting? And if so, is this only in counties with vote centers? How about those with neighborhood polling places? Yes, yeah, so uh, um, <clears throat> the, the amount of in-person early voting is gonna depend a little bit on the county in which you live. You know, there's 15 counties that have adopted the Voters' Choice Act. Uh, and so in those counties, uh, you know, people have already become used to vote centers where you can vote at any location in the county convenient to you uh, in, the, in the days leading up to the election. It'll be a minimum of four days of voting, three days of early voting, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, and of course, election day itself. Uh, Non-Voters' Choice Act counties, there's going to be a few who think they can uh, recruit enough poll workers and find enough voting locations to simply have the traditional polling places up on election day. But even in those counties, uh, every voter will receive their ballot in the mail in advance of the election. We're, we're going to encourage vote by mail as the first choice, but polling places will be open for voters who need that option. But I think there's a lot of traditional polling place counties that uh, frankly are struggling to recruit enough poll workers and find enough voting locations, but they've asked to consolidate a lot of the polling, uh, the number of polling locations. And uh, we're going to allow them to do that, but in exchange for offering in-person early voting. So again, a minimum of four days of voting, 
three days of early voting plus election day itself. Uh, so it's important to maintain these in-person options for folks who need it. Uh, but the first recommendation is going to be vote by mail, vote by mail, vote by mail. We're making it easy by making sure that we send a ballot to every voter in the mail a month before the election. Would you recommend that voters vote early in order to mitigate the crowds on election day? Uh, definitely, and, and you're reading my mind. You know, I think it's a very common sense strategy that we're uh, employing here. The more people we can convince to vote early, whether it's by mail or safely in person, will reduce the lines, you know, mean smaller crowds and a safer experience on election day, both for voters as well as for elections workers. Uh, right? We've got to be mindful of the people on the other side of the table uh, when you go vote. Uh, so again, we're going to encourage people to vote by mail if you can, if you're willing to. But for people who need that in-person option, it'll be there. And rest assured, it's going to be as safe of an experience as possible. We're working it together with counties to make sure that we don't just have enough ballots prepared and enough voting booths in each location but that there's plenty of PPE, right? The, the, the gloves and the face masks and the hand sanitizer and that we're implementing all the physical distancing and uh, cleaning protocols uh, to uh, make sure voting is safe during COVID-19. And how can we find those locations for early voting and vote by mail drop off? Right. So just as it is the case with every election, county elections officials do notify the voters of uh, either their designated voting location, if you're in a polling place county, or where your options are to be able to vote uh, in the other counties. So check, uh, uh, check the mailbox for the official communication from the county, or you can always go online and view your county elections department website, uh, or you can contact the Secretary of State's office uh, online. We're at vote.ca.gov. One of the tools there is to find my polling place. Uh, or you can call us uh, in the weeks leading up to the election at 1-800-345-VOTE. We're happy to assist. And um, you know, there'll, there'll be plenty of communication out there. So uh, uh, let's get ourselves ready. And I would like to add to that by saying that I believe that there's going to be that link on the Sierra College uh, engagement website. And I will mention it at the end but I believe that it will be included on our website so that students can find it on there as well. Good. And at this point, I will now be passing it over to Yulia who will be interviewing Senator Allen on the topic of early voting, the Voters' Choice Act, and the youth vote. Thank you, Camelia. Let's take a look at how it became easier to do early voting and to submit your ballot. Senator Allen sponsored the Voters' Choice Act, which passed in 2016. It modernizes elections in California by allowing counties to conduct elections under a new model, which provides greater flexibility and convenience for voters. Senator Allen, could you elaborate more on how does this law do this? Yeah, well, thank you so much, Yulia. I appreciate this opportunity to, to speak with your, with your students. Uh, so the bill, um, the act basically allows for counties to choose to opt into this new voting model um, with, with two very important changes from our current model. So firstly, every registered voter receives a ballot in the mail. It you know, comes to you. You can either um, uh, mail it in or you can bring it in to a vote center or drop box. Secondly, we create vote centers. Uh, so, so the bill allows for uh, vote centers to be opened up um, in, in, you know, in advance of election day and be open for a number of days up to election day. And that allows for in-person voting or ballot drop-offs uh, instead of the traditional uh, polling places. The idea is that for those counties that want to do this, the old model of only being able to vote in one place in one, on one day in one location uh, within a, a set period of time was really, you know, did not provide enough flexibility to people. And the idea now is that you can either vote using your vote by mail ballot, or if you do want to vote in person, you can vote anywhere in your county, uh, anywhere there's a vote center in your county. Um, and under the bill, it's up to 11 days before election day. Now that's been reduced a little bit in the context of COVID uh, because they're having some challenges. But uh, but it basically, it's all about trying to, it's trying to, it's all about trying to give people more access. 
Uh, the idea is that the voting centers, you can vote, you can drop off your, your vote, you can register to vote, you can update your voter registration information at the vote center, you can receive replacement ballots, you can use an accessible voting machine uh, if you have any sort of disability. You can also receive a language assistance. And we worked very closely with a lot of groups that represent language, uh, you know, language minorities, folks who speak other languages besides English. And, and there's a lot of uh, there's, there's computer technology that can assist people who may be hard of hearing or, or may, may, uh, may be more comfortable working in a different, uh, work in a different language. So, um, so there's just more flexibility allowed. And, and ultimately, I think it better conforms with the busy and complicated and mobile lifestyles of a lot of the people who go to Sierra College. Very nice. Uh, so I'm curious, as you were talking about all the counties participating, are all counties actually implementing this or is it happening in phases? It's happening in phases. So of our 58 counties in the state, 14 were eligible to opt in during the 2018 election. Uh, five counties chose to do so, Madera, Napa, um, Nevada, Sacramento, San Mateo. Um, then all other counties were eligible to opt in during the 2020 election. 10 counties chose to do so. Uh, so Amador, Butte, Calaveras, El Dorado, Fresno, LA, Mariposa, Orange, Santa Clara, and Tuolumne. Now, um, there's, you know, COVID has thrown a little bit of a monkey wrench into the situation. So now everybody's being sent a ballot by mail regardless, just because we want to make sure that, um, that everyone's going to be able to vote. And, and COVID is, has, has kind of messed things up a little bit. Um, so your, your student population, those that live in Nevada County, they should be already pretty familiar with this model because that's what they had, um, you know, since 2018. Placer County. Um, has not opted into the system uh, yet. Um, they can whenever they want to, if they decide to. But because of the new regulations that we put in place, all folks who are registered in Placer County are going to receive their ballot in the mail this fall. They can return the ballot in the mail. They can return it to a vote center or to one of you know, the ballot drop-off locations that are going to be available throughout the county. And then obviously, for those people who live in other counties around the state, they'll also be receiving their ballot by mail so they can vote that way. Perfect. Uh, so what motivated you to sponsor this legislation? Well, it's interesting. You know, you mentioned in the introduction, Swami, yeah, that there was, um, you know, we've, we've seen such high voter turnout in the 2018 elections. In 2014, we had record low turnout. And one of the things we did was we were really struggling with that. We were, you know, what, what can we do to make it easier for people to vote? What can we do to make it more convenient? And we really studied um, multiple models. We went to Colorado, actually took several trips to Colorado to learn about what they'd done, where they'd been able to put in place a system very similar to what we have done here in California now. And they were able to you know, decrease costs, but also dramatically increase voter turnout. And it was ultimately all about making it easier. That's really what it was all about. And so, um, you know, it, it just, it's, it, it's about more flexibility. And this idea that, that, that you can only vote in one place on one day is so antiquated. And unfortunately, some other parts of the country, they're really doubling down that system, probably because they want to make it harder for people to vote, to be honest, because some of the status quo politicians that have been running the show for a long time have benefited from lower voter turnout, lower voter participation. In California, we're taking the opposite direction. We've been really trying to make the system more accessible, more open to more people. It's our belief that we'll have a more robust, vibrant, meaningful, responsive democracy if we truly make it easier for people to participate and get more people to participate. This is amazing. Uh, and based on my research, the state legislature has passed bills to make it easier for young people to vote as well, including allowing 16 years old and 17 years old to pre-register. Senator Allen, you weren't in the office yet when this passed in 2014, but if you were in the office, would you have supported this? Oh, yeah, I think it was a very sensible bill. It, 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 you know, one of the problems that we have is that um, one of the biggest barriers to entry that we've seen is uh, into, to the political process is just the fact that young people are not automatically registered to vote. They should be, right? I mean, if you go to a lot of countries, when you become eligible, you're automatically registered. Why do we create this extra burden for people? The government can find out in five seconds you know, whether you're eligible. I mean, just a quick type on the computer on, a, on, on, on any number of government databases, they can find your citizenship, your age, your eligibility. 
And yet we require young people to take that extra step of filling out an additional form. And all that means is that there's a whole group of young people who do eventually get registered, by the way, but they just takes them a few years. Maybe someone doesn't, you know, show up at their college campus and register them. So, you know, from my perspective, the more, the, the quicker we can get these people into the system, the better. I will say that as good as that bill was, um, we've now taken it another step further, which is to, to say that now, it, it, you know, the new law, as it's, it's going to be phased in, if you are eligible to vote, um, you, you can opt out, but, 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 but effectively, when you go and do your paperwork at the DMV for other things, either an ID card or your driver's license, you will automatically now be entered in to the voter registration process unless you specifically say that you don't want to be. And so these are all ways to make sure that we lower the barriers for entry for youth to, to engage and be able to participate. Because there's nothing worse than having a young person wait in a long line, get all excited about elections, and then realize that they're not eligible to vote because they missed some registration deadline a few weeks before election day. So you know, that's crazy. We, we need to make sure that those young people, we capture that energy and we capture that, 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 that interest and, and allow them to participate. It's their right, it's their responsibility, it's our obligation to, to ensure that right and responsibility. I totally agree with you on that. And are there any other bills focused on youth voting that are being considered now? Yeah, um, so there's right now there's, a, there's a, 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 an assembly, so ACA4, which is a, a constitutional amendment that we're looking to put on the ballot that would permit a 17 year old to vote in the primary election if they're gonna be eligible, if they're gonna be 18 by the general election, right? We have this huge gap between our primary election in March and our general election in November. If you're gonna be, you know, that that, th those two elections are married, right? You're, you're, you're basically, you're effectively making the same decisions about in the, in the primary, you're deciding who's gonna be on the ballot in the November election. So it stands to reason that if you're gonna be eligible to vote in the general election, you ought to be able to also vote in that, in that same cycle mm -hmm. Uh, presidential election. So I certainly support that. I, I voted for it. I think it was a very sensible, um, sensible bill. It's, it's making its way. It's actually going to be on the ballot now uh, as Proposition 18. So people will be able to vote for it. And I, I'm, I'm really hopeful that it will become law. Well, we'll, we are hoping for that as well. And thank you, Senator Allen, for providing more background on youth voting and actually forwarding the effort on the Voters Choice Act. Now, I'm turning it over back to Camelia. Thank you, Yulia. Secretary Padilla, in addition to making it less cumbersome for, for the youth to register to vote, there have been other mandates to ensure access to voters who face hardships, the disabled, those who are limited English proficient, and those who completed their prison term. A recent survey done by USC Center for Inclusive Democracy, formerly known as the Civic Engagement Center, found that 63% of voters with disabilities want to be able to use a voting machine in an in-person environment. How does California ensure access to voters with disabilities in registering to vote and while, while submitting a ballot? That's a good and very important question. Uh, you know, we recently celebrated the 30th anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, huge landmark legislation at the federal level uh, for the nation. And uh, in that it requires, uh, you know, public accommodation for people of different abilities, including elections. And so in California, we require that voting locations, all those polling places and vote centers that we talk about, uh, be accessible. Doesn't matter if somebody may be hard of hearing, uh, hard of, uh, you know, uh, seeing if they have an issue with eyesight, uh, or, you know, maybe they're in a wheelchair, whatever the uh, accessibility concern might be voting locations have to be accessible to all voters. And it's not just the location itself, it's the voting system and the voting equipment themselves. So there are accessible voting systems that have been tested and certified for use in California for the people who need them. So uh, yes, plenty of in-person accessible voting options uh, for, for voters. And increasingly, uh, because vote by mail has become increasingly popular in California, we are pioneering now also uh, remote accessible vote by mail systems. You know, a lot of voters may choose that in-person experience, but even if you choose to vote from home, you deserve the ability to vote privately and uh, independently, you know, and, and maintain your uh, confidentiality, your privacy of your ballot. So we wanna make sure that we have those accommodations in place for all voters, 
regardless of how voters choose to vote. Wow, that is really great. And how does California ensure access to those who are limited English proficient? So, uh, another good question, because California doesn't just have the most populous, uh, the, the largest population of any state in the nation. We also have the most diverse population of any state in the nation and the largest and most diverse electorate of any state in the nation. And a lot of voters in California, uh, right? So they're citizens, they're older than 18, but have a primary language preference other than English. And so the Federal Voting Rights Act does require that uh, uh, California, the state and local elections officials make a lot of elections materials and voting materials available uh, to voters in their language of preference uh, for languages that uh, reach a certain threshold and have certain concentrations uh, in each particular county. Uh, in California, we've taken an additional step uh, looking at uh, our own language studies within state and added additional languages for local officials to make materials available uh, in a voter's language of preference. So uh, I, I think the biggest recommendation I would have is when you register to vote, aside from your name, your address, your date of birth, et cetera, one of the questions you can answer is your language preference for those voting materials. Uh, and if it is Spanish, if it is Mandarin, if it is, you know, whatever the case may be, you can designate that on your voter registration record. And that's how the county will be able to know uh, to send you information in those languages. Uh, even if you don't, uh, you can make that request of the counties. A lot of time the uh, materials and translations are available online as well. Uh, and if you need to update your registration, you can do that at the same website, registertovote.ca.gov. That is really incredible. And can felons vote after serving their prison terms? Yeah, I uh, forgot that, that other part of the question. Uh, yes, California, I think, is on the most progressive end of uh, restoration of voting rights for individuals who have uh, been formerly incarcerated. So the current law in California says uh, you know, any, anybody who is a citizen 18 years or older, uh, with minimal exception, you have the right to vote. But among those exceptions are individuals who may be in state prison or on parole for a felony conviction. Right? A felony conviction is the key here. Misdemeanor uh, convictions, you still can register and you still can vote. Uh, but there's actually a measure on the ballot this November. Uh, the voters of California will decide uh, whether or not to restore the franchise to individuals on parole. Uh, not to individuals who are still in state prison, but the question will be, do we allow individuals who are no longer in state prison, they're on parole, reintegrating into their community, the ability to register and vote in future elections. And so uh, that would move California again into the more progressive end of the spectrum when it comes to uh, 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 franchisement laws across the country. Wow, uh, thank you for that. And I know you touched on this earlier, but going back to our topic on voting adjustments due to the pandemic, um, will in-person voting adhere to strict public health and social distancing guidelines? Uh, they will. Let me just tack one thing onto the prior question. We do have a tool on our website. So I mentioned vote.ca.gov, many tools and functions there. One of them is labeled Restore Your Vote. So if you have any questions as to whether you or someone you know uh, has regained the right to vote or not, you can go to that tool, answer a couple of basic questions, and it will let you know uh, whether you can indeed register and vote. Um, but your question about in-person voting and how we're going to make sure that we make it as uh, safe as possible. But first of all, by trying to reduce the crowds and the lines and the wait times, uh, by encouraging vote by mail, vote by mail, vote by mail. Uh, but uh, for people who need to vote in person, we want to make sure we have as many in-person opportunities to vote as possible, uh, both on and before election day, right? Because if we can uh, minimize the number of people coming in person and then even taking those folks and spreading them out over four days, we're really reducing the concentration of those gatherings uh, at voting locations. That plus... Uh, you know, think of how we go to the grocery store now. You can't do it the same way anymore. Between physical distancing, masks are required. There will be uh, uh, plenty of hand sanitizer on hand. You know, the, uh, the poll workers will be donning uh, personal protective equipment as well. 
voting booths won't be placed side by side. They'll be spread out at least six feet. All the basic public health uh, directives that we keep hearing about will be integrated into the uh, in-person voting experience uh, this fall. But the first choice is still going to be vote by mail if you can. Thank you. And at this point, I would like to thank both Secretary of State Padilla and Senator Allen for their time and the information that they have provided us with today. More information on voting access, registration, and civic engagement can be found on the Sierra College website under sierracollege.edu slash vote and on the Secretary of State's website, sos.ca.gov. Thank you so much. Thank you.